Hi everyone, my name's Kevin and welcome to Think Tank. Today we'll be talking about a play that was originally premiered in 1991, Angels in America by Tony Kushner. The play was actually originally premiered in just one part called The Millennium Approaches, but Kushner added the second part, Perestroika, a couple years later. Since then, both parts have been performed both separately and together, combining up to a six-hour performance since 1991. It's seen success in many different places, such as Broadway for some time, which netted a couple of Tonys, as well as an HBO series production in 2003. Kushner's play has seen success since its premiere mainly because of its ability to tackle issues that were considered controversial and not worth talking about by the time of its inception, such as the AIDS epidemic and issues surrounding LGBT plus people. However, with anything that becomes super popular, I think it's good to examine why it was so popular during the time, and if it was to be performed today, what would be the benefits and cons of doing it now? Today I'd like to go over a basic overview of the plot, examine the background of the play, and go over some of the pros and cons if Angels was to be performed today. So without further ado, let's begin! Angels in America focuses around the lives of eight different characters, whose actors play the varying roles that fill out the rest of the cast in this fantastical New York setting. These characters include Joe and Harper Pitt, Lewis Ironson, Pryor Walter, Roy Kahn, Hannah Pitt, Belize, and the titular Angel. The play mainly focuses around the dysfunctional relationship between Joe and Harper and Lewis and Pryor. The former has a Republican Mormon lawyer, Joe, deal with the issue of being offered a job in Washington by Roy Kahn, his mentor and advisor, while knowing that his wife Harper is terrified of moving and leaving their apartment. Roy Kahn is actually a representation of the real-life person of the same name, who is infamous for his involvement in getting many gay people fired from the government and dying of AIDS in real life. The Roy in real life actually did mentor Donald Trump and taught him a little bit about business and politics, which kind of explains a lot, really. The latter's relationship begins to crumble when Pryor shows Lewis that he has Kaposi's sarcoma, one of the leading signs of AIDS in people during the 1980s. Lewis ends up leaving Pryor due to his inability to care for him in his sixth state. Belize, Pryor's ex-boyfriend, ends up taking care of him, as well as Roy when he discovers that he has AIDS and finds himself in the hospital. Both of the relationships in the play dissolve for separate reasons, which resolves in Joe and Lewis starting a new relationship together at the end of part one. Millennium Approaches was produced first at the Eureka Theater in San Francisco, LA in 1991, and Perestroika was first performed in 1992 at the Mark Taper Forum. The two parts weren't performed together until 1993 on Broadway at the Walter Kerr Theater, and has been produced in separate parts and together multiple times since. Kushner's styling for how the play was performed can be largely linked to its popularity. The scenery was kept to a minimum, scene changes happened in real time, and the mythological characters were displayed as clearly flying in on wings and using stagehands to increase their size. Kushner went on record to say that, in regards to the angels, it's okay if the wires show, and maybe it's good if they do. Much like the styling of Bertolt Brecht's epic theater, Kushner's play was highly political and commented on issues at the time, mainly HIV and AIDS, which was a large part of what gained the play its fame. This fame was due to the political climate surrounding AIDS during the 1980s, when the epidemic began to ravage America. In 1981, cases of Kaposi's sarcoma and pneumocystis carini pneumonia, otherwise known as PCP, skyrocketed specifically in gay men around the country. Not much information was known about the virus during the early days of its spread, and there wasn't a huge push from the government administration to research it either, leading to a lot of confusion about what caused AIDS to develop in people. While today we know that unsafe sex and sharing drugs are the largest contributors to transmission, the fact that mainly gay people were contracting AIDS in the 1980s led many people to label it as gay cancer. This wasn't helped by news sources publishing articles calling it such and claiming that AIDS was God's wrath against homosexuals. Many anti-LGBTA people use the epidemic as a fight back against the gay rights movement, claiming that even casual contact with a gay person would give someone AIDS. This pushback led to a lot of discrimination against gay people and people who had AIDS, as they were stereotyped as gay if they came out to have it. One such case was Ryan White, a young high school student who contracted AIDS due to an error during a blood transfusion. His school banned him from returning even though he had no play in getting the virus, and he died from it not five years later, being one of thousands of Americans to have died from HIV and AIDS-related reasons. While there were laws that eventually came around to protect those who have AIDS, such as the ADA, or Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Red Ribbon Project, 
They are disenfranchised in many places, such as doctors and nurses refusing to care for them, parents and family members abandoning them, and many considered those who had AIDS to be abominations. This is all important in understanding why Kushner's play was so influential. Many people during this time didn't want to talk about the AIDS epidemic, or if they did, they didn't care about the people who were dealing with it. However, Angels in America does not play around with showing the dark and gritty sides of the disease. Both Pryor and Roy have AIDS in the play, and Kushner does not shy away from showing the explicit, graphic, and downright cruel ways that they're treated. Nothing is sugarcoated. We are shown the full extent of how the disease affects their lives, both their own health and the way that they're treated by other people. Not only do we see the experience of people dealing with AIDS, but we see the experience of people who are openly gay at the time as well. We have openly gay characters such as Pryor and Lewis and Belize, who clearly from their characters show that they have experienced stigma and discrimination before. Both Roy and Joe are both closeted gay men in the story, and neither of them actually end with a happy ending. Whilst Pryor survives at the end of the play and seems to like he's going to live the rest of his life, Roy actually dies from AIDS during the play. Lewis, even though he had broken up with Pryor, stays friends with him at the end of the play and is kept in his inner circle. Meanwhile, Joe doesn't have any contact with his wife anymore, and at the end of the play, we have no conclusion on where his character is or what happened to him. The play reflects the way that the lifestyle was for many gay people at the time, because there are happy endings, but at the same time, there are many that are not. It's messy and graphic in a lot of ways, and I think that's a big reason as to why it's so popular today. For many people, this is what they believe to have been an honest and realistic depiction of both the AIDS epidemic and LGBT issues in America. However, there's a reason why I say most believe that, because while the play is great in many ways, we do have to approach some of the issues with it as well. For example, the cast of Angels is predominantly white, and the only person of color acts as a nurse and care figure for the other characters. Many have critiqued the play for its white-centric story and protagonist, as it doesn't give an honest depiction of the AIDS crisis in America, leaving out the fact that a large number of cases are made up by people of color in a disproportionate amount. There also isn't much that we learn about Belize as a character, as they mainly act to care for or support the other white characters in the play. Some have suggested that this paints Belize as a mammy archetype, a racist stereotype that depicts a black character as a caring nurse-like character whose only role is to help the white characters. Angels may tell an honest and true experience for many white gay men, but that doesn't mean it's the be-all, end-all tale for all of Americans. There are many plays, stories, and movies that have come out depicting the experience of people of color with AIDS, such as Tongues Untied by Marlon Riggs, Kathy Cohen's Boundaries of Blackness, and Kevin Mumford's Not Straight, Not White are just a few examples, yet none of them have received quite as much attention or praise as Kushner's play. I think it's important when talking about plays like Angels, which is incredibly important to American culture and brings up traumatic experiences, that there are many works that get glossed over or don't mention the experience of people of color in them, which doesn't give an honest or realistic depiction. I think it goes without saying that Angels in America has had a profound impact on American culture. There are many people today who understand more about AIDS and people in the LGBT community because of this play. Many people who would not be able to sympathize with those same people if they didn't see this. Just like The Laramie Project or Rent, Angels fits into those categories of LGBTA plays that highlight a specific instance of discrimination or problem in America and brings it to light for people to talk about and change. However, we can't ignore the fact that sometimes these plays don't give the full story of LGBTA experience, and it's true that it's not always supposed to. But I hope the takeaway here is that going forward, there should be a push for a wider breadth of plays and stories told about all experiences on a given subject. We can appreciate the stories that helped us in the past and strive to improve on areas where they fell short at the time. Thank you for watching today. I hope that you learned something or at least got something out of this video that you didn't have before. I'll leave links in the below of the resources that I use so you can see a bit more in depth as to what I wasn't able to talk about. Either way, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.